want you please to put your hands together and to thank God for the ministry gift in Bishop and the apostolic gift in Carlton Pearson. Will you receive him as a bishop and as an apostle of God? If you will, clap your hands and say, we receive you, Bishop Pearson. Come on, thank God for him now as he can. minutes Lord that you will let me speak there's been so much taking place but let me speak in very quickly very briefly but very solidly what you would have me to say to this people I've seen your glory or at least I've seen your goodness thank you and bless them as they go and as they come apostolically we extend to them the blessing of the Lord rich blessing keep your servants humble before you meek in your presence forgive our sin blot on our transgressions wash us in the blood of the lamb cleanse us and sanctify us by thy truth for thy word is truth and we wait upon your great God in Jesus Christ thank you Lord amen God bless you thank you be seated you are so sweet I promise you I'll not be long. I wanted to um, put my head under a box and hide tonight. Um, when we started this conference, eight, um, today, this is the eighth conference. Eight is the, the number of new beginnings. When we started this conference, uh, the, the hardest thing for me to deal with was the fact that everybody so not everybody but so many people said don't try to do something that's already been done and uh, you're trying to bring something back that's gone forever God is going to do something new don't use that name and even if you do it's not the original Azusa because they didn't have any announcements they didn't run any ads people just came it was a sovereign move of God you're in the flesh I mean we went through all kinds of hellish thoughts and a lot of what the people were saying was factual but it wasn't true and we had to fight it and went on with it. Because I'm not trying to, first of all, you cannot remember anything you never knew. Thousands never even heard of us, they don't know what it means. And we've not even articulated it to the way that we're supposed to or going to. But we obeyed the Lord. And when God spoke and said that we must not advance the conference with noted names and, you know, the poor people, he wanted to know how many of us are just interested in him and I don't want this to become a conference where people are showboated just so they can you know go out and raise a bunch of money or start their own ministry though I hope that many ministries are birthed out of here or enhanced or incubated out of this conference that's why I look for the charming young men and women that you've seen this week who have and I say charming I mean they charm me with their gifts they charm me and I know most of their fruits and I love them and I respect them. 
I want them to go forth. I want all of you to go forth. I'm very secure in me. I know what God has told me to do. I know who I am, and I'm not anxious to get on everybody's platform. God has been good to me. I think I could preach from now on and never run out of invitations if the Lord continues as he is. That is not my objective. With this conference, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, I want to read you the text, and I promise you this won't be long. This is the text God gave me for the conference, Exodus 33. Now, mind you, uh, the children of Israel have just made a terrible mistake. Um, they've only been out of bondage about 11 months and they're already backsliding they're already messing up and the, pro the, the leader is upset how many of you are leader every one of you that's a pastor or leader raise your hand right now nothing could be more tedious no calling more tedious Moses said to the Lord you have been telling me lead these people King James says bring them up out of bondage but you have not let me know who you will send with me the reason I've been hesitant in moving any farther with the fellowship or even with the conference because I have not been sure who God was sending with me. You have said, I know you by name. That is, I know your character. I know your posture. I know your position. Moses is saying to God. And you have found favor with me. Lord, somehow you let me know that, Moses said. If you have found favor with me and uh, if I have found favor in your eyes teach me your ways Derek in Hebrew teach me your customs teach me your manners teach me your, your MO your modus operandi so I may know you and continue to find favor with you please stay with me remember that this nation is your people some of you remember a few years ago when Dr. Miles Monroe was preaching at this conference we were not in the full arena but we were in the Johnson Theater and he called me forward prophetically how many of you remember that conference some of you were here and my eyes are closed and I was weeping and and thousands look like thousands got up from the chairs and you remember brother Copeland came down and held my arms up and and I told my staff the next day you mustn't mention one word of what happened here last night you will not repeat what happened and I will make no reference to it and you mustn't speak of it again until I speak of it not that that was not an ordained event but the people were not ready to receive they thought they were, but we have a tendency to idolize our leaders and make little gods out of them. And I have fought that image for so many years. Uh, people love me, and I know that, and I love people, and people honor me, and, and many dishonor me, but I, I, I'm so careful because I'm, some of you don't know that the, the most famous black man on the face of the earth, his name is Nimrod. He built the city of Babylon and Assyria and Nineveh and modern day Iraq. He was a huntsman of God, an African, son of Cush. He could kill the big game. History shows me that ultimately he became the Baal. They worshipped him as a god. We have our Haley Selassie, our Papa Docs and Baby Docs and Idi Amin. We tend to worship our leaders and that has what, that's what has thwarted at least black people for years from really maturing to the place that they would have because we deify our leaders. I don't want to be paranoid about it, but at the same time, I'm trying to walk as carefully and as, as, as uh, meekly as I can. And meekness doesn't mean weakness. before I was 40 years old and I knew that something was going to happen after I was 40 and I'm now married and I have a son and I was waiting on some things because God had spoken to me that I would be married Brian Keith I don't know if you remember the message God gave you in our church and I could go back and show all that many of you have prophesied and I was waiting for certain things to take place before I would accept certain leadership positions and certain influence on folks or even to launch this whole thing. Stay with me. But I said, Lord, you're going to show me who will go with me. But I'm in in the spirit, not just mentally and, and not just uh, with the attitude. But I'm, I, I needed to know by the Holy Ghost who would go with me. Moses wanted to know the same thing because folks will love you today and hate you tomorrow. 
They'll, they'll build you up and lift you high and then do what they did. Moses went up into the mountains for 40 days and they said, uh, we don't know what's going to happen to this guy. We don't know when he's going to come down on our level. So they built their own God. Some folks couldn't wait for me to come down from wherever I've been. <laughs> and uh, they got mad and, and decided they were going to do their own thing. But I had to stay in the presence of the Lord until he sent me down. Some of y'all can relate to what I'm saying. And I've been waiting. It's been a battle that I fought on my own. Then Moses said to him, if um, the Lord replied, verse 14, my presence will go. My presence, my presence. What I know in front and in back. My prior knowledge, my master plan, my sovereign will will go ahead of you. It'll go with you. My presence will go with you. Now earlier, God said, Your, these folks that I've sent to you are so rebellious and so retarded until I can't go with you because they're going to make me mad and I'm going to kill them. I can, I can read, read you the very, in, the, in the 33rd chapter. Just in front of that, uh, uh, 33, 3 and 5. Um, verse, let me start with the first verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, and I'll do all these miracles, and you're going to have the land. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. God said, if I let people do to me what has been done too often before, he was going to kill them this time. So I slowed down. You better hear me. They'd backslidden just before. Moses wouldn't move when they wanted him to move. He wouldn't do what they wanted him to do because once you have a leader, then you just, if you vote him in, then you want to tell him what to do. He doesn't give you what you want when you want it. Then you'll turn on him and listen. It is so sensitive where we are and where we're going right now. If you speak wrong, and that was the word, if you say the wrong thing, God will lock your tongue up in your mouth. And some will be dead because God is like a sheep bear. He is birthing something at the close of this century and the close of this millennium as he does each time at the close. Endings mean new beginnings and new beginnings mean ending. If you start, excuse this term, if you start messing with God's stuff right now and get in the way of it, he'll kill you. That's why he said, I, I, I don't want to destroy so I'm not even going to go with you. This presence, this power you want, I can't go with you because the folks ain't going to do right. When the people heard the, these distressing words, verse 4, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites you are stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. God has an, a temper. And this time, he is so serious as we come out of this century, out of this decade, out of this millennium, into a whole new millennium, God is so sensitive and he's, he knows exactly what he's doing and we've got to be right in step with him this time. Now, let me, let me go back. I promise you I won't be that much longer. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do everything. Wait a minute. Where, where, what verse was on? Verse 14. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you. What you sensed before, God, we got here. Whatever you knew before Carlton Pearson ever was born, every man and woman in this building, before we ever got here, the master plan, your presence must go with us. He said, I will, in other words, you will be right in line with my master plan. I don't want my own little thing. I want to be right in the middle of God's master plan. I've got to see myself as a part of God's whole. I've got my own church, my own ministry. I can do a lot of things on my own, but, 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 I, but God is saying think broader, think larger, think inclusively. Black, white, red, yellow, and brown. And we don't have the number of non-black people following the conference like they will at some point because it's still new, has black leadership, large black attendance, and it's just not, even in this city, it's not comfortable. For me to pastor a church in Tulsa, that's uh, four or 5,000 people, and to have uh, a large contingent of non-black people that's history. What God, what God is allowing to happen in our church 
he plans to happen in this conference and among the body of Christ at large. You better hear me now. I've been walking very carefully to hear what God is saying. God is going to bring the integration. That's a whole other subject. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. I don't want to do anything, God. I don't want to start nothing. I In fact, I planned this year, if God didn't show me something, there would have been another, not another conference that I would put on. This was the end of it. If God didn't give me something other than a conference, I don't just want to have another conference. Are you hearing me? And you have shown me tonight that we're going to put some feet and hands and legs, a body on this spirit. I know the Azusa spirit, but I didn't have an Azusa body. We couldn't do anything. Now I know that we're going to leave something. Listen, this Azusa television network is going to be so powerful. I don't know hardly where to begin. But when you come back next year, and we, as we celebrate the 90th anniversary, and let me tell you, I was afraid to move. I've been on TBN for eight years. And when God allowed me and gave me permission to go off last November, I don't want to hurt my friends. So those people are sweet to me. They put me on for four years free, have nothing bad to say. And I figured if I, here's a young black man, what you going to do? So you're going to start your own network. That is not a, I'm not trying to do that in my flesh, but I'm telling you, it was scary. I didn't, I wasn't even sure. I didn't announce it to too many people because I didn't want any, anybody to talk me out of it. I didn't tell very many people I was inviting Jim Baker. I didn't tell anybody I was inviting Benny Hinn. I also made a phone call to Jimmy Swaggart. I called him in his home. He called me back. We talked. I said, I just want you to, f I, I, I'm going to go out of this decade and out of this century with nothing but forgiveness in my heart and restoration. I said, get your stuff together, whatever that means. I love you. I, I bless you. I repent for attitudes and judgments. I don't know what you're going through, but I want you to know you're welcome in this conference. And I'm going to tell the people it's all right to forgive you. It's all right to love you. It's even all right to listen. Maybe it wasn't time for him to be here. Maybe it was. But he didn't feel comfortable coming among the saints in America. When do we forgive? And I knew when we went back last night, Jim Baker, all he could say, he was in the back last night. He didn't feel comfortable to come in, but he was listening to the word and enjoying the meeting. And we spent some time afterward. One of the things he said is when I walked out on that stage, Wednesday night, he was telling Benny and all his people and all, Dr. Paul, Bishop Paul and all of them, he said, well, those people loved me. They received me. He said, you don't know the healing that took place in me. He said, I just wanted to stand there and take it in. If nothing else happened, that was his, that was glory right there. If we didn't have the network, that right there is enough to take us a long way. Then Moses said to him, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? Everybody say, he's going with us. This is not a fleshly thing. This is not a man birthed thing. This is ordained of God. Every one of you that's going to flow with this thing, his presence is going to go with you. You're going to experience them. Every one of you that made a sacrifice, it's hard for me to see people getting up coming. And I know it's sacrificial giving that you gave tonight. I don't know what the number is, but it may be exactly what God said. I was believing God for two million for this conference and two million ultimately, but I, I think we got so close to it. I, and others, it's going to come in more after this, but the blessing is on all of us. What else will distinguish me from your people? I thought I said, Lord, what's going to distinguish me from all your other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, now you've got to catch this. I will do the very thing you've asked because I'm pleased with you. And I know you by name. 
Then Moses said, well now, Lord, show me your glory. What could that have meant? He'd seen the pillar of cloud by day. He'd seen fire by night. He'd seen the Red Sea part. He'd seen water out of the rock. He'd seen manna from heaven. And the Bible said that Moses talked to him face to face. What was he asking for? What do you want? We have shouted and jumped and rolled and cried and laughed and quickened and spoke in tongues and seen miracles. What does Carlton Pearson want from God now? What am I asking to see? What do you want? Another album? A bigger church? More people? A better car? Do you want to quicken more? See all the people charging to the platform to get a touch by brother by Benny. Maybe I'll go down in the spirit. Oh, what we what we really want is not just to be slain. We want the presence of God. We want the presence of God. I don't care if your church is that small or you're not even called to the ministry at all. You just want the presence of God. Are you listening to me? When I say presence, I want what God presents, what he knows before I got here. I want to know how I fit into his master plan. I want to know God's design purpose for me, for you, for this conference, for every church service we have. Why are we here? What are we doing? I can't say it like I feel it, but that's all right. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. Show me your rare. The word actually means that he will come out. It means your rareness. Your rarely. Show me that weightiness, the heaviness. Show me the master plan. Don't just let me see. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness, my favorites, my best, my beauty to pass in front of you. And I'll proclaim my nature, my notoriety, my name, the Lord most vehement in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Say it. And I have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Say it. But here's what he said in verse 20. But you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Well, didn't it say in the, in the chapter before that Moses spoke to God face to face? Do you know you can speak to God face to face and still not see his face? When it says face, it means the part of the body that turns. You can't see us everywhere. God can look in the past. He can look in the future. He can look now. He can look behind. He, he, he said, you, you can never really know my full appearance and live because there's so much in the face of God. It would kill you just to look at it. He said, but I will show you my goodness. The glory is reserved for me in Jesus Christ. And that's a whole other theological thing that I'm not going to try to get into right now because I want to point to, to what God is saying as we close this meeting. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. Um, I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. But he said, verse 20, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place, however, near me. Look at me for a minute. In a minute, I'm going to send you from this place into that place. You're going to be nearer him than you've ever been before. There is a place near me where you may stand on Jesus. Upon this rock, I'll build my hurts, my church, on the, on the anointing of Christ. When my glory passes, when Jesus got ready to go to Calvary, he said, it's time for the Son of Man to be glorified. He really could have used the English word crucified. I'm now, he said, when my glory passes, that happened in Jesus, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. You will see what's left in the wake of Calvary. You will see what's left in the wake of the crucifixion. And that is the church that he placed on this planet. What the glory is, as best as God's going to reveal it to us, is in the body. Black, white, red, yellow, brown, brown in the body. Say, everybody say, in the body. In the church. Say, that's me. Say, there's glory in me. There's glory on me. There's glory around me. Stand up. I'm almost finished on, on the last part of this. The Lord said, there is a place near me where you can stand on the rock. Then I will remove my hand and I will show you my back. But my face, you must not be seen. 
I got a call this this week that I must go Sunday to Oklahoma City. I've always had a dream that I should meet Billy Graham someday, but I thought I never would. But he, along with President Clinton, is coming to Oklahoma City for a prayer meeting. And they've asked me to go down to Oklahoma City to give the closing prayer in a big stadium, about 9,000 people they're expecting. Have to be there at a certain hour because the security is real tight and the president's coming and Billy Graham is coming. And it's something very profound in this thing. Even what took place in Oklahoma City this week. There's so much more I was going to say, but the Lord told me specifically to accept my leadership, to accept my call, to accept the purpose. He said, if they call you bishop, don't worry about it. If they call you preacher, if they call you boy, don't worry about it. Just pay attention to what I call you. He said, I call you by name. The lady called from the Dallas news today she said I, I read your list it's the governor's wife suggested that I come and close the meeting in prayer because I did it for their inaugural their Catholic family Frank Keating and his wife we've known for years and so they called from Dallas and said would you give us an interview would you and the Dallas something some paper and we want to ask you about what's happening and the violence and what are you going to say and so I, I spoke to them they said but your name they told us that you were going to be there it is now finally time for people of our persuasion and maybe even of our culture and color to rise to a different level that is not necessarily political but it's powerful in spirit. Are you hearing me? To put out that newspaper, Stephen Strang was here the first two days, my friend, Stephen Strang of the Charisma Magazine. And we produced our own magazine, ready to make it available. He was here and I thought, Lord, we got another Christian television network, we got another Christian, but now you're saying start a network, start a magazine, circulate it among the people, call them into to order, call them into structure, tell them that we're now going to do something other than shout and jump and rejoice, that we're going to turn the crack houses into church houses, that we're going to turn them into school houses, that we're going to go home with a new anointing. I want every pastor to come and stand in front of me right now first, every pastor right in front. When I asked God for his glory, I didn't know if it was going to be a cloud in here or a pillow of fire. And the Lord said, no, I'm going to do something real practical. I'm going to pray a corporate prayer in just a moment. Sweetheart, come and stand near me. Every minister, come and stand right behind these pastors. I used to say there's never been, there was never been a, a, um, an evangelist comparable in scope to a Billy Graham or an Oral Roberts that's black. William Seymour was the closest to it and then Dr. Martin Luther King. But I believe had we accomplished in the spirit what God intended to happen at Azusa, there would have never been a need for a civil rights movement because the church would have integrated in such a way. We would have never needed a Martin Luther King who incidentally became an idol in many homes. Martin Luther King and JFK, you see them two in Jesus, pictures in many homes. My great-grandmother died at nine, almost 101 years old. She had their pictures. It was almost like a little shrine in there. Are y'all hearing me? All we knew was civil rights and political activism because we weren't flowing in the power of God. Bishop Mason and J.W. Seymour humble man, Bishop Mason had a two second grade education. It was very interesting that Henry Ford, Bishop Ford, passed the week before this conference started. He's the last man that's associated directly with the Bishop Mason regime. The only prayer we have recorded of Bishop Mason, his name is mentioned. Thank you, Pastor Ford and all of the brethren. God in Jesus Christ rebuked the day of evil and cast the devil out of the minds of all. In 1977, I had a visitation, a vision in my room, right down the street, the little outrigger apartment. I mean, the Emerald Green was called then. And in that vision, I saw Bishop Mason come into my room, sit on my bed, talk to me all night long. 
he died in 1961 I'd only seen him once in the flesh and that and I saw him the night he came to Jackson Memorial Church of God in Christ in San Diego California and Bishop Crouch came and Mother Hale and Mother Barry and everybody was there and the place was so packed they shut down all the Kojic churches and everybody came to our church and so when Bishop walked in the folks were beginning to quicken and fall then they took all the little children out so there'd be more room for the adults but I got a little glimpse of him and I remember hearing that prayer on a 78 record when I was in the fifth grade I listened to it every morning, Brother Vincent, every morning before I went to school for a solid year. Mahalia Jackson, some of the songs I sang, Jesse May Renfro sat down in Oklahoma City, Caravans. I listened to that album and I'd, 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 I'd go in the den and get dressed for school when I was in the fifth grade, prayer, preparing for school, listening to that prayer and crying and praying. And sometimes I'd forget that the, where the bus stop was and that I was to go to school and the, the bus would leave where they normally pick this up and stop on the corner where my house was and blow the horn. And I'd realize I'd got to catch that bus and I'd grab my little brown paper sack and go running across the field to the bus, eyes swollen, red, bloodshot, and I, I was embarrassed. I didn't want the kids to think I'd gotten a whipping, but I, I'd rather them think I'd gotten a whipping than to think I was in there speaking in tongues. So I told them I got a whipping. <laughs> and I stayed with that. And then when he went in that room, and he, here's the only thing I remember Bishop Mason saying to me, and he was there all night in that dream or vision, whatever it was. He said, remind the saints of the hope. When I woke up that morning, that's what I heard him say. Remind the saints of the hope. That was in 1977. Uh, Azusa, he spoke to me 10 years later in 1987. But we started, the, had the first one in 1988 because it took me a year to delay. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confer upon you right now some hope for your own dreams, for your own calling, and for your own purpose. And you pastors are going to have a new anointing, a fresh wind. You're not going to fall. I'm not going to blow. I'm not going to throw nothing at you. I want you to walk out of here like many women of God, full of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to accomplish what God has called you to accomplish within the master plan. Okay? I laid aside. People say, why don't you preach in this conference? I see all of you. You, you are incredible men and women. You have so much to offer. And I, when I first came here in 1971 to Oral Roberts, I said, Lord, there's so many that I want to include in this. I saw the charismatic renewal. I saw the movement, but I didn't see very many blacks. I didn't see very many classical Pentecostals. I said, Lord, how can I bridge it? Show me where, show me how, show me when. And so I started inviting others and inviting others. And I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. They called me an Uncle Tom. They called me an Oreo. They called me a coconut. They called me everything. But I just kept doing what God said. And it's still not understood altogether what I'm, do, what I'm doing. Not even to me. But when God brought this woman in my life, and she, she wanted to wait a little longer for that boy. Because I only knew her. I met her in May. Married her the following September. She conceived October 28th. <laughs> the boy was born July 9th. He was supposed to, he was due July 24th. And I had a son and I wept. In one year, I had a wife and a son. I was 40 years old when I met her and God had spoken in this conference about that prophetically. Bernard Jordan didn't mention it and others had mentioned it publicly in this meeting. Two years, God had spoken in my heart. And let me you look at me, every eye on this preacher. We're going to do something this year. And you are a part of it. We're going to shake this nation for Jesus Christ. And the world. Now the last thing, you apostolic council members, come and stand here. And others of you are part of the fellowship, but I want the apostolic council or ruling councils to come and stand and face the people with me. These are men and women that are standing with us. Their wives are here. Many of their wives are here. Stand up here, Rita. You ought to be with this group. There are, there are some women here. I'm going to commission these men and women under the Holy Ghost. Some of them are great evangelists. Brian Keith is writing a Cushite theology. Some people are against the Cushite theology. I gave an interview this week with the Charisma Television Show. On the, the reason, one of the reasons we had to emphasize this Cushite theology is the black Muslims are sweeping through our community. 
and they are intelligent and they're provocative and they're very interesting to listen to and they know more about what they're talking to about than some of y'all know what you're talking about. Uh -oh. 